For the fourth session of the afternoon, I would like to invite uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Lawrence Rowe and, chair, uh, and the Chairperson Professor Dr. Berin Aksoy. Hello, distinguished professors, distinguished colleagues, and dear students. Before starting this session, I would like to congratulate the English department for their efficiency in organizing such a fruitful conference. I have taken great pleasure in listening to the papers, and we had the opportunity to hear thought-provoking scholarly papers on Shakespeare. So I'm grateful to the organizers and the distinguished speakers for their contribution and efforts. So now let's get back to our speaker of this session, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Lawrence uh, Raw. Let me say a few things about his, uh, uh, from his CV. Uh, Lawrence Raw received his PhD in 1989 from the University of Sussex in Renaissance Studies and Comparative Literature. From 1992 to 1999, he was affiliated with the British Council as a London-appointed British Studies Manager based in Ankara, and that was how we got to know uh, Dr. Raw. And he had the responsibility at that time of creating new cultural and screen studies curricula in the universities in Central and Eastern Europe. And Turkey was one of them. <laughs> in this period, while he was serving for the British uh, Council, uh, he also gave courses at the under and postgraduate levels in English and media studies at universities in Istanbul, Izmir, and Ankara. He has a, a wide teaching experience all over Europe, including Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, the Ukraine, Georgia, Romania, and Bulgaria. Uh, Dr. Roth taught at Hacettepe University, Department of English Language and Literature, from 1990 to 1999, during which time he was one of the key pupil in the development of the British Cultural Studies programs at that department. He has published numerous articles and books in the fields of cultural studies and screen studies. In addition to, to the many volumes he edited or co-edited, Dr. Raw also serves on the editorial board of prestigious international journals in these fields, in Turkey and in abroad. While Dr. Raw currently teaches at Bashkent University, he is looking forward to the time when he can, when he can become a full-time writer to work on projects as diverse as Shakespeare in Second World War Britain, character actors in Hollywood films, value in adaptation, and a study of six recent Turkish filmmakers, all of which he has been contracted to produce. So we are looking forward to your productions. And the floor is yours. Can you hear me at the back, or will I have to use the microphone? Can you hear me at the back, or, or is, it, is it difficult? You can hear me. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because, well, I would like to thank Professor Butchin Errol for letting me come to this conference. I apologize for the quality of my voice, but uh, this is the first conference paper I've given since I had a bit of an illness, and I'm still recovering from radiation therapy at the moment. So my voice sounds a bit like a rusty file at present, for which I apologize. If I conk out, which means if I suddenly become hoarse after 20 minutes, please forgive me. It's an interesting thing, just before I start, that um, when I first came to this department in 1990, 
Shakespeare was the very first course that I actually taught. And in fact, I took Erzum somewhere. She was a student in my class, which actually shows how old I am. <laughs> In fact, the front row is full of quite a few people who are former students of mine. This is one of the things you discover about getting old, that you suddenly realize that those people who are fresh-faced youngsters when you are in your 30s are now getting more gray hair. And then when I suddenly realize that I am nearer 60 than 50, this is when I start to get old. Anyway, enough BS. Now let me go on with what I'm going to talk about. What I want to talk about today is not Shakespeare per se, but I want to talk about Shakespeare in the Second World War. And what I'll talk about today, in fact, is I'll talk about three things in brief. Firstly, I will try to sketch in the context in which the Shakespeare production I'm going to talk about takes place. Then I will give an introduction to the actor manager that I will talk about. Then I will give some idea of what the production that I'm talking about was like. And one of the beauties of this microphone is that I can keep talking while moving. <laughs> right. Let me, it is now lunchtime. Excuse me. It is now lunchtime. You are sitting quietly waiting for me to talk. But I would like you to imagine that you are sitting there at lunchtime and outside there are aeroplanes flying outside, dropping bombs. And that you are in the theatre and that the theatre is highly likely to get bombed. So in the middle of a Shakespeare performance, you might suddenly have somebody on the stage saying, there is an air raid. There are aeroplanes coming over and they're dropping bombs. Those of you who wish to leave the theatre can leave. Those of you who wish to stay can stay. If you stay, you could get bombed. If you go, you can go down to the shelter or you could get bombed as well. <laughs> and what is happening is that in September 1940, you have the Blitz, where you have German planes which are bombing London in retaliation for British planes bombing Germany. And at that time, the theatres are closed. The cinemas are closed. So there is absolutely no entertainment. And then one day in late September 1940, you have an actor manager whose name is Sir Donald Wilfit, Donald Wilfit at the time. And he gets the idea that he wants to put on a season of lunchtime Shakespeare in a 1,100 seat theater for the benefit of office workers. And the reason why he wants to do that is for two or three reasons. One, he's providing entertainment for office workers who are going to their offices worrying about the bombs and coming home again. Number two, he is a patriot. He is someone who understands the importance of Shakespeare as a national symbol at the time, during wartime. Those of you who may know Henry V, if you don't, you may know that Henry V is a very patriotic play. And as a patriotic play, God for King Harry and St. George, I think I'm misquoting, but anyway, Henry V is a patriotic play. And during wartime, Shakespeare is used as propaganda. Why is Shakespeare used as propaganda? One, he is perceived as English, England's greatest national 
poet. Two, he writes in fifth, between fifth, the 16th to the 17th century. He is three or four hundred years old. You might find Shakespeare exceptionally boring. I did when I first studied it. Still do, actually. But <laughs> Shakespeare as a three or four hundred year old symbol becomes a symbol of British history. British history is old. British values cannot be allowed to be destroyed by the Nazis, by the Germans, by Hitler. British values are long-lasting. We must preserve the British Empire. Remember in 1940, Britain still had an empire. So Shakespeare is perceived as being a national and a patriotic symbol. And as Professor Uman talked about, Shakespeare writes about all people, aristocrats, lords, ladies, brothel keepers, mistresses, you name it, he writes about it. Shakespeare is for all people. Shakespeare is for everyone. So therefore, if you put Shakespeare on at the theatre, he is going to attract all people and bring people together. This is the idea. So if we look at the auditorium now, we have the teachers at the front looking at their phones. <laughs> And students at the back looking at their phones. <laughs> but if I came into this hall and I didn't know anybody, I could not distinguish except on grounds of age between teachers and students. If I didn't know people, I would just see you as a group of people. That is what was understood by Shakespeare in wartime. It would bring people together. Now, why was that important? Because Britain in 1940 was a very class conscious society. More so now than it is, more so then than it is now. Some of you may remember or be aware of the British stereotype. The cold, snotty nose person who speaks like that. When I first came here, people thought I was like that. But I've been here too long now. Mason. <laughs> this is all to do with the British idea of superiority. And in 1940, you would have big social divisions between the aristocrats, those people who spoke in this type of way, <laughs> and the people who spoke like that, <laughs> the lower class people. And so if you went to London at the time, you would see the big social divisions between these people. But once they came into the theatre, it didn't matter. Donald Wilfit charged cheap prices for everybody. And he insisted that everybody sit in one row like this, because the theatres at the time had different levels, a lower level, three levels. Each level corresponded to a different class, because it had a different price. But in wartime Shakespeare, he closed the top two levels and had 